uh, chapter 6. The people that lived in hiding. Now began the happiest times that Caspian had, had ever known. On a fine summer morning, when, when the dew lay on the grass, he set off with a badger and the two dwarfs up through the forest to a high saddle in the mountains and down onto the sunny southern slopes where one looked across the green wolds of Archulin. We will go first to the three bulgy bears, said Trumpkin. They came in a glade to an old hollow oak tree covered with moss, and Truffle Hunter tapped with his paw three times on the trunk. And there was no answer. Then he tapped again, and a woolly sort of voice from inside said, Go away. It's not time to get up yet. But when he tapped the third time, there was a noise like a small earthquake from inside, and a sort of door opened, and out came three brown bears, very bulgy indeed, and blinking their little eyes. And when everything had been explained to them, which took a long time because they were so sleepy, they said, just as Truffle Hunter had said, that a son of Adam ought to be king of Narnia, and, and all kissed Caspian, very wet, snuffly kisses they were, and offered him some honey. Caspian did not really want honey without bread at that time in the morning, but he thought it polite to accept. It took him a long time afterward to get unsticky. After that, they went on till they came among tall beech trees, and Truffle Hunter called, called out, Pat away, pat away, pat away. <sighs> and almost all at once, bounding down from branch to branch till he was just above their heads, came the most magnificent red squirrel that Caspian had ever, had ever seen. He was far bigger than the ordinary dumb squirrels, which he had sometimes seen in the castle gardens. Indeed, he was nearly the size of a terrier, and the moment you looked in his face, you saw that he could talk. Indeed, the difficulty was to get him to stop talking, for, like all squirrels, he was a chatterer. He welcomed Caspian at once and asked if he would like a nut, and Caspian said thanks. He would. But as Patterwig went bounding away to fetch it, fetch it, Truffle Hunter whispered in Caspian's ear, Don't look. Look the other way. It's very bad manners among squirrels to watch anyone going... To his store, or to look as if he wanted to know where it was. Then Padawig came back with a nut, and Caspian ate it. And after that, Padawig asked if he could take any messages to other friends. For I can go nearly everywhere without setting foot to the ground, he said. Truffle Hunter and the dwarfs thought this a very good idea and gave Padawig messages to all sorts of people with queer names telling them all to come to a feast and council on dancing lawn at midnight three nights ahead. And you better tell the three bulgies too, added Trumpkin. We forgot to mention it to them. Their next visit was to the seven brothers of Shuddering Wood. Trumpkin led the way back to the saddle and then down eastward on the northern slope of the mountains till they came to a very solemn place among rocks and fir trees. They went very quietly, and presently Caspian could feel the ground shake under his feet as if someone were hammering down below. Trumpkin went to a flat stone about the side of the top of a water butt and stamped on it with his foot. After a long pause, it was moved away by someone or something underneath, and there was a dark round hole with a good deal of heat and steam coming out of it, and in the middle of the hole, the head of a dwarf very like Trumpkin himself. There was a long talk here, and the dwarf seemed more suspicious than the squirrel or the bulgy bears had been, but in the end, the whole party were invited to come down. Caspian found himself descending a dark stairway into the earth, but when he came to the bottom, he saw firelight. It was the light of a furnace. The whole place was, was a smithy. A subterranean stream ran past on one side of it. Two dwarfs were at the bellows. Another was holding a piece of red-hot metal on the anvil with a pair of tongs. A fourth was hammering it, and two, wiping their horny little hands on a greasy cloth, were coming forward to meet the visitors. It took some time to satisfy them that Caspian was a friend and not an enemy, but when they did, they all cried, Long live the king! And their gifts were noble. Mail shirts and helmets and swords for Caspian and Trumpkin and Nigabrick. The badger could have had the same if he had liked, 
But he had said he was a beast, he was, and if, and if his claws and teeth could not keep his skin whole, it wasn't worth keeping. The workmanship of the arms was far finer than any Caspian ha had ever seen, and he gladly accepted the dwarf-made sword instead of his own, which looked, in comparison, as feeble as a toy and as clumsy as a stick. The seven brothers, who were all red dwarfs, promised to come to the feast at, at Dancing Lawn. A little farther on, in a dry, rocky ravine, they reached the cave of five black dwarfs. They looked suspiciously at Caspian, but in the end, the eldest of them said, If he is against Miraz, we'll have to him for king. And the next oldest said, Shall we go farther up for you, up to the crags? There's an ogre or two and a hag that we could introduce you to up there. Certainly not, said Caspian. I should think not indeed, said, said Truffle Hunter. We want n none of that sort on our side. Nickabrick disagreed with this, but Trumpkin and the Badger overruled him. It gave Caspian a shock to realize that the horrible creatures out of the old stories, as well as the nice ones, had some descendants in Narnia still. We should not have Aslan for friend if we brought in that rabble, said Truffle Hunter as they came away from the cave of the Black Dwarfs. Oh, Aslan, said Trumpkin, cheerily but contemptuously. What matters much more is that you wouldn't have me. Do you believe in Aslan, said Caspian to Nickabrick. I'll believe in anyone or anything, said Nickabrick, but that I'll batter these cursed... Tell marine barbarians to pieces or drive them out of Narnia. Anyone or anything, Aslan or the White Witch. Do you understand? Silence, silence, said Drivel Hunter. You do not know what you are saying. She was a worse enemy than Miraz and all his race. Not to dwarf she wasn't, said Nickabrick. Their next visit was a pleasanter one. As they came lower down, the mountains opened out into a great glen or wooded gorge with a swift river running at the bottom. The open places near the river's edge were a mass of foxgloves and wild roses, and the air was buzzing with bees. Here, Truffle Hunter called again, Glen Storm, Glen Storm. And after a pause, Caspian heard the sound of hoofs. It grew louder till the valley trembled, and at last, breaking and trampling the thickets, there came in sight the noblest creatures that Caspian had yet seen, the great centaur Glenstorm and his three sons. His flanks were glossy chestnut, and the beard that covered his broad chest was golden red. He was a prophet and a stargazer, and knew what they had come about. Long live the king, he cried. I and my sons are ready for war. When is the b b battle to be joined? Up till now, neither Caspian nor the others had really been thinking of a war. They had some vague idea, perhaps, of an occasional raid or some human farmstead or of attacking a party of hunters if they ventured too far into these... Southern wilds. But, in the main, they had thought only of living to themselves in woods and caves and buildings up an attempt at old Narnia in hiding. As soon as Glenstorm had spoken, everyone felt much more serious. Do you mean a real war to drive Miraz out of Narnia? asked Caspian. What else? said the centaur. Why else does your majesty go clad in mail and, and girt with, with, with sword? Is it possible, Glenstorm? said the badger. The time is ripe, said Glenstorm. I watch the skies, badger, for it is mine to watch as it is yours to remember. Tarva and Alambil have met in the hall, halls of high heaven, and on earth the son of Adam has once more arisen to rule and name the creatures. And name the creatures. The hour has struck. Our council at the dancing lawn must be a council of war. He spoke in such a voice that neither Caspian nor the others hesitated for a moment. It now seemed to them quite possible that they might win a war and quite certain that they must wage one. As it was now past the middle of the day, they rested with the centaurs and ate such food as the centaurs provided, cakes or oaten meal and apples and herbs and wine and cheese. The next place they were to visit was quite near at hand, but they had to go a long way 
round in order to avoid a region in which men lived. It was well into the afternoon before they found themselves in level fields, warm between hedgerows. Their travel hunter called at the mouth of a little hole in a green bank and out popped the last thing Caspian expected, a talking mouse. He was, of course, bigger than a common mouse, well over a foot high when he stood on his hind legs and with ears nearly as long as, though broader than a rabbit's. His name was Reepicheep, and he was a gay and martial mouse. He wore a tiny little uh, red beard at his side and twirled his long whiskers as if they were a mustache. There are twelve of us, sire, he said with a dashing and graceful bow. And I place all the resources of my people uh, unreservedly at your majesty's disposal. Caspian tried hard and successfully not to laugh. But he couldn't tell thinking that Reepicheep and all his people could very easily be put in a washing basket and carried home to one's, on one's back. It would take too long to mention all the creatures whom Caspian met that day. Cloudsy Shovel the Mole, the three hard biters who are badgers like Truffle Hunter, Camilla the Hare, and Hogglestuck the Hedgehog. They rested at last beside a well at the edge of a wide and level circle of grass, bordered with tall animals which now threw long shadows across it, for the sun was setting, the daisies closing, and the rooks flying home to bed. Here they slept on food they had brought with them, and Trumpkin lit his pipe. Nigger Brick was not, was not a smoker. Now, said the badger, if only we could wake the spirits of these trees in this well, we should have done, done a good day's work. Can't we? said Caspian. No, said Truffle Hunter. We have no power over them. Since the humans came into the land, felling forests and defiling streams, the dryads and naiads have sunk into a deep sleep. Who knows if ever they will stir again? And that is a great loss to our side. The Telmarines are horribly afraid of the woods, and once the trees moved in anger, our enemies would go mad with fright and be chased out of Narnia as quick as their legs could carry them. What imaginations you animals have, said Trumpkin, who didn't believe in such things. But, but why stop at trees and waters? Wouldn't it be even nicer if the stones started throwing themselves at old Moraz? The badger only grunted at this, and after that, there was such a silence that Caspian had nearly dropped off to sleep when he thought he heard a faint musical sound from the depth of the woods at his back. Then he thought that it was only a dream and turned over again, but as soon as his ear touched the ground, he felt or heard, it was hard to tell which, a faint beating or drumming. He raised his head. The beating noise at once became fainter, but the music returned clearer this time. It was like flutes. He saw that Truffle Hunter was sitting up staring in into the wood. The moon was bright. Caspian had been asleep longer than he thought. Nearer and nearer came the music, a too wild and yet dreamy. And the noise of many light feet, till at last, out from the wood into the moonlight, came dancing shapes such as Caspian had been thinking of all his life. They were not much taller than dwarfs, but far slender and more graceful. Their curly heads had little horns, the upper part of their bodies gleamed naked in the pale light, but their legs and feet were those of goats. Fawns! cried Caspian, jumping up, and in the moment... They were all round him. It took next to no time to explain the whole situation to them, and they accepted Caspian at once. Before he knew what he was doing, he found himself joining in the dance. Trumpkin, with heavier and jerkier movements, did likewise, and even Truffle Hunter hopped and lumbered ab about as best he could. Only Nickerbrick stayed where he was, looking out on in silence. The fawns footed it all round Caspian to their reedy pipes. Their strange faces, which seemed mournful and merry all at once, looked into his dozens of fawns, um, mentius and uh, uh, obentinus and dumbness, volens, voltinus, gerbius, uh, mm, uh, 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 nasus, and uh, Oscans. Powderwig had said them all. When Caspian awoke the next, mo next morning, he could hardly believe that it had not all been a dream, but the grass was covered with little cloven hoof marks.